Hi, I'm Stu from HiveMind Automation and welcome to The Hive. In this video, we're going to be building my new Prusa i3 Mark IV 3D printer. As we go through, I'll talk a little bit about the cost, why I chose this printer, and maybe even discuss some of the alternatives that I could have chosen. And in a future video, we'll be taking a look at integrating this 3D printer with Home Assistant, possibly using two different methods to do so. I'm pretty much just going to roll the build footage while I talk about the printer. So while I roll the intro, why don't you take a moment to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you get notified when I release new videos, normally each week. While you are at it, if you like what I do here and do want to support the channel, there's affiliate links to some smart home gadgets that you can buy for your own smart home and support the channel at the same time without it costing you any extra or you can support the channel directly through my buy me a coffee link. Of course, those affiliate links and my buy me a coffee can all be found on my website, hivemindautomation.com.au. With all of that out of the way, let's get started. So I started the build by unboxing everything, getting myself organized, and then I started assembling the frame of the printer. Now, if you've been watching the channel for a while, you might know that I've been into 3D printing for a while, and I bought my first printer, a Prusa Mark III, about six or seven years ago, and it's been an awesome printer. I've installed some upgrades and modifications over the years, including Prusa's multi-material unit. And one of my favorite things about the printer is the fact that it is open source and upgrades from Prusa are almost always backwards compatible to the earlier models of printer. I've been thinking about getting a second printer for a while. And when Prusa introduced their Mark IV printer late last year, I knew that that was what I wanted to get. There's even an upgrade path to upgrade my Mark IIIs Plus to the same specifications as the Mark IV, although the kit for that is a little bit pricey, and to be honest, a whole printer wasn't that much more. I ordered my Mark IV kit during Prusa's Black Friday sale, which had the added benefit of free worldwide shipping and considering the kit was already 799 US dollars, that helped out a lot, but I did also then have to pay $262.43 Australian in import duties. You can buy an assembled printer from Prusa for $1,099 US, which will bump the import duties up a bit further if you are in Australia especially. So that, coupled with the fact that I like to tinker, and especially in this case, I like to understand how the printer goes together and how it all works, I decided the kit was the right option for me. I do have to say though that FedEx and DHL really need to do something about the way they handle communications for things like the import duties. The text messages and emails that they send to collect payment for import duties do look a lot like phishing scams. So that is something to look out for and just be very, very careful about where you're putting your credit card details. All of that said, the printer did arrive at my doorstep about two weeks after shipping from Prague, which is insanely quick to get from the Czech Republic to Australia in that time. Now it's fair to say that there are other printers out there with an objectively better feature set like faster printing speeds, a full enclosure, or even maybe a cheaper price point. So before anyone gets into the comments section with why didn't you just buy a Bamboo X1 Carbon, I ended up sticking with Prusa because it's open source. It's the manufacturer that I know and the brand that I'm personally most comfortable and familiar with. I'm sure the bamboos are great printers, but the closed source nature is just a little bit of a bridge too far for me. Building the kit is pretty involved. All told, the build did take me just shy of eight hours, and this is the fourth Prusa build that I've done. For the most part, I just ended up putting my headphones on and getting to work. 
I should probably also mention that the build footage that you're watching is actually my second Prusa Mark IV build. This one's actually for my father-in-law who recently decided to get into the 3D printing hobby and asked for my advice on 3D printers. Now, I originally suggested the Bamboo A1 Mini, but the very next day, Bamboo Labs issued a recall for the faulty power connector that was causing fires in some cases. And I'd also suggested the Prusa i3 Mark IV as another alternative, and he chose to go with the Prusa. Again, going for the kit saved my father-in-law a few dollars on the import duties, and it also earned me a nice bottle of whiskey to take care of the build for him. So I can't complain too much about that. Now, in this instance, the printer being open source saved me quite a bit of messing around because during the build, I did discover that one of the 3D printed parts in the kit had broken during shipping. This wasn't a problem though, because firstly, the files for the 3D printed parts are readily available on printables.org. And secondly, I'd already printed a full set of all of the 3D printed parts in preparation to, at some point in the hopefully not too distant future, upgrade my Prusa Mark 3S Plus printer. So I was able to grab the replacement part that I'd already printed and use that instead. With only a very slight delay while I hunted through my spare parts box to find it. Now, obviously, if this is your first 3D printer, you might have a hard time sourcing a replacement part. But Prusa's online support team are available to help out if you do find that something goes wrong during the build. Or you can also, as I mentioned, grab the 3D files and have a friend, colleague, or uh, find a local makerspace. It is worth mentioning though that you do need to print these parts out of a strong and durable PETG filament. So having access to Prusa's support team very much put my mind at ease during the build because they're able to ship out any missing or broken parts pretty quickly. Unfortunately though, the tyranny of distance here in Australia does mean that it is going to take some time. So if you are stuck in that position, you would be stopped dead until that replacement part does arrive. Thankfully, I've personally not had to make use of the service, but I've yet to hear a bad story about the process of getting uh, assistance with the Prusa builds and the Prusa support team. Now, I do have to say that one of the features that drew me to the Prusa Mark IV that's new from the Mark III S Plus is the load cell bed leveling. When the printer prepares to start a print, the hot end touches the build surface at a few different locations on the build surface. And using the load cell that's in the hot end, it detects exactly where the build plate is and then builds up a map or a mesh of the bed so that it can compensate for any unevenness in the build surface. Prusa markets this function as enabling a perfect first layer every time. Initial videos demonstrating this feature from some influencers also uh, showed this feature being used to print on some pretty wildly uneven surfaces, even a, a sheet of cardboard. So the, the perfect first layer every time is certainly not an inaccurate claim, but it is certainly an oversimplification. Prints on the Mark IV are still prone to some of the standard printing issues like when you print a larger flat part that's a bit thick, it can still warp and lift away from the build surface in the corners as the plastic cools and shrinks. So you may end up needing to put mitigation strategies in place for these kinds of issues like making sure that you keep your build surface super clean with isopropyl alcohol, adjusting the build plate temperatures and possibly to temperatures that might be higher than what you might be used to with the particular material that you're printing with or even printing inside an enclosure. Prusa do have an enclosure kit that you can buy and build for your 3D printer that would help with some of these situations and especially if you're planning to print with materials like ASA, ABS or nylon. Those materials pretty much can only print inside an enclosure because they have a tendency to shrink and warp pretty badly if you are printing in the standard open frame kind of construction that we have with the base model printer here. Another great addition to the Prusa Mark IV is the built-in network connectivity, either using the ethernet port that's right on the main XBuddy board or the included ESP01 module that 
enables Wi-Fi connectivity. I have to say that I was super surprised that the Wi-Fi was provided by an ESP01. It's the same Wi-Fi module and microcontroller that we saw in a previous DIY project with ESP Home and a relay board. That said, using the ESP01 does then mean that there's going to be the inherent limitation of 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi with this particular device. Adding network connectivity does enable the use of Prusa's PrusaLink platform, which allows a local network control and monitoring of the printer, similar to what we can get via Octoprint. Unfortunately, there's currently no native method to connect a webcam to PrusaLink unless you're running PrusaLink on an external Raspberry Pi, and there's no camera built into the Mark IV. However, there is a Home Assistant integration for PrusaLink and Prusa also have a cloud offering called Prusa Connect, which can integrate a phone camera or webcam from another source. And it also has a Home Assistant integration. Prusa Connect also then adds the ability to connect multiple printers into a single central portal where you can then manage those printers and print queues uh, in one central place. Prusa Link on the Mark IV does still have a beta banner on it and the lack of detail and functionality in some cases within the web interface does kind of make it a little bit obvious to me that it's not yet a finished product. If anyone from Prusa is watching, I'd really love to see the addition of a printer management tab uh, and even some printer settings so that we can then go in and change some of the settings of the printer that would normally only be available through the on-screen menu on the printer itself. To be able to then also see stats about the printer from Prusa Link would be great and even a method to update the firmware using the web interface would be excellent as well. Another method of remote management of your printer is via Octoprint. Now when I first got my Mark IV, Octoprint didn't yet support the Mark IV, but at the time of writing it seems like Octoprint does now support the Mark IV and Prusa's own knowledge base even includes an article on how to set Octoprint up with the Mark IV. I've done a video about integrating Octoprint into Home Assistant before, so if that's something that interests you, I'll put a card in the top right hand corner for you now. And in a future video, I'll explore Prusa Link and Prusa Connect and the Home Assistant integrations for those. I may even revisit Octoprint at another point in the future if people are interested. Another thing I've really enjoyed about the Prusa Mark IV is that since a firmware update that came out right before my printer arrived, the Mark IV now supports input shaping. If you're not familiar with input shaping, as I understand it, it basically enables much faster print moves by predicting and compensating for the amount of wobble that's going to occur at the nozzle when the printer makes those faster moves. This then means that the hot end can move faster, not only moving when it's not laying down plastic, but it can also move faster while plastic is being extruded, but minimize the artifacts that show up in the final product, like ghosting and ringing. Input shaping does, however, tend to soften any sharp detail, but to be honest, FDM printing is probably not the best way to get super sharp detail anyway. To illustrate the impact that input shaping has on print times, I sliced a print for both my Mark 3S Plus and my Mark IV, and on the 3S Plus, Prusa Slicer calculated a print time of 24 hours and 37 minutes. On the Mark IV, with input shaping enabled and all of the other print settings identical, the same file was reduced down to 11 hours and 31 minutes. It's still a pretty long print, but saving more than 12 hours, more than half of the print time is pretty amazing. I've not run the print yet, so I can't really say if that slicer estimate is accurate or not. But so far, I've yet to be given a reason to doubt those slicer estimates. So far, the print quality that I've been able to get from the Mark IV, even with input shaping turned on, has been pretty great. I do definitely need to do some fine tuning on some of the settings to get the absolute best results, but I'm already getting reliably repeatable results on every print. And in reality, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So that was my Prusa i3 Mark IV build. I've been running my printer for about three months now, and my father-in-law has had his for about three weeks now, and we're both pretty happy with the printers. As I mentioned, my Prusa Mark III has been a workhorse for me for years, and the Mark IV does feel like an awesome upgrade, but still keeping the reliability and repeatability that I came to expect and love from my Mark III.
As I mentioned, I will 100% be getting the upgrade kit to turn the Mark III into a Mark IV at some point in the not too distant future. And because I've also got the multi-material unit on my Mark III, I'm going to need to upgrade that. Now I may end up doing the MMU upgrade before the, doing the Mark IV upgrade so that it's not a huge update in one go, but I'll keep you posted. If you or someone you know is interested in getting your own Prusa 3D printer, I'll put some links in the video description. So if you buy a printer using my link, I earn some Prusa meters on printables.com and so will you. Prusa meters can then be redeemed for free rolls of filament, various Prusa swag like t-shirts, curated 3D printing and design how-to courses, or vouchers towards the purchase of a Prusa printer among other things. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments section below and let me know if you're interested in seeing more 3D printing content on the channel. That is all we have for this video and I do hope that it's helped you in your smart home and 3D printing journey. Be sure to drop a comment below with a home automation idea that you'd like to see me cover in a future video and don't forget to follow Hivemind Automation on Instagram and Facebook. If you liked this video, hit the thumbs up button down below to give it a like. And if you're not already subscribed, now's a great time to consider changing that. While you are at it, if you hit the bell icon, you'll then start getting notifications when I release new videos, which is normally each week. Lastly, if you like what I'm doing here and you want to support the channel, there is a buy me a coffee link in the video description below. Any contribution you make through buy me a coffee does get put towards making more and hopefully better content for you to enjoy. Don't forget to check out my website, hivemindautomation.com.au. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Stu from Hive Mind Automation, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.